What a fun story to explore the relationship between writers and editors. Oh, you may be saying? Let's break this one down in this view. Welcome to the Codex Cantina where I am Una. And I love physics crypto. <laughs> Today we're exploring the tale of the house of physics by Yoko Ogawa. If you're into a conversational approach to literature, hit that subscribe button to join us on the journey. And as always, start off with publication information. The Tale of the House of Physics was first published in Monkey Business Volume 1 in 2011, and our version was translated by Ted Goosen. Now, Yoko Agawa, we read her Memory Police together a little while ago, and I've read two of her other works before a mystifying and magical author where she's one of those that can reinvent her writing style every single time. I, I can't believe it's the same author every time I pick up her works. I agree. I would not believe you if you had told me that she wrote this story because I comparing it to memory police, it feels like two different authors. And to me that shows true greatness when you can convince somebody that you're able to pull off this story and not have that same vibe or feel, it gives it that new flavor, which I love. In terms of themes for this story, we're going to explore the storytelling process in terms of the role between the editor and writer. I really like my interpretation on this one. I hope you guys enjoy this one because I liked it a lot. We're going to talk about <laughs> taking control. We're going to talk about validation too. Kind of a fun piece, this one. So in terms of plot, it opens up with a narrator who's retiring from his job as a book editor. And small random note, if you constantly thought of the book editor as a male, let me know down below because I constantly kept thinking of it as a girl, I think because I knew that the author was a woman and it, it drives me nuts that I kept making that mistake. He views his job as editor was that of least inconvenience or pervasiveness to the writers. He would take his editing role to that of encouragement and that of guidance more so than crafting or or telling an author how to do things like maybe some of the flashy editors did for best-selling books. Now, what he's doing is he's writing names down on this little manila envelope on his last day, looking back on his career. He writes down all the books and the people that he worked with. And one, the first one strikes his fancy. It was the tale of the House of Physics, the first book he ever edited. So we jump into a flashback when the narrator was a younger boy. And he recalls growing up across from an old abandoned admin office that was once a particle physics building. The building was soon in disrepair and an eyesore on the neighborhood. However, it did provide housing for a woman that lived there, but nobody knows where she came from. <laughs> <laughs> She'd walk around babbling and tell everybody, though, that she was a writer. And the narrator even one day stumbles upon the woman at the market, and he follows behind the woman as she drops these pieces of paper on the ground and written upon the paper are wishes that she would her book would appear in bookshops that people would read it that people would like it those sorts of things some days later the narrator and his friends found this dead weasel and buried it at the house of physics okay and the narrator returns later to find that the the woman living there is weak and almost kind of dying on the cot and she turns out she ate some poisonous mushrooms and when he goes outside she had plucked the poisonous mushrooms from the spot that he had buried the dead weasel. So he starts to get a little bit of guilt, starts taking care of her, bringing tea, some vegetable soup, and she starts mumbling, the greatest story ever told. <laughs> <laughs> so he takes it upon himself to start writing down this story, right? He listens to her, and sometimes it's hard to hear what she's saying, but he's doing the best that he can to capture her story, if you will. Later on in life, the narrator, you know, after everybody gets okay and returns to health, he gives her a copy manuscript of the story called The Tale of the House of Physics and leaves it behind for her to find. He's too embarrassed to give it to her directly. One spring, the lady left town, and the town barely remembers she ever existed. End plot. <laughs> yeah, so real side note there. For me, knowing that the author of this story is female and that the narrator is male actually kind of added some interesting qualities to the story of why she maybe wrote him the way that she did. Because I know you kept saying that you viewed that the narrator was also female. So mm -hmm. kind of mm -hmm. weird how our brains did that, right? Well, the relationship was clearly something. I mean, that was the focus of the story right, is, is how these two maybe changed each other's lives, in a sense. One got to be heard, 
one found their calling in a sense of listening to others, perhaps. And I think editor is a big title, particularly today. You know, when we think of what an editor does, sometimes they're selecting books of what's going to be published, what's not. Sometimes they're working more hands-on directly with the author, reading their, their story, providing guidance, providing edits, maybe sometimes just kind of editing and not providing guidance. But there's a lot of different ways that the editor hat is, is worn today. But it is still a relationship that before a writer becomes a writer, well, in most cases, they go through an editor for that process to happen, right? Yes. And for me, this part of the story is where it becomes kind of meta, is where you have an author writing about an editor for an author of this lady who wants mm. to be an author. Yeah. And it, it has all of these, these layers. And I, I love how she takes his story of her story to turn it into her own. And what does that mean of this relationship between editor and author? Do you think she wrote this as kind of like a love letter to the unsung hero of the novel? Like editors have such a big role and sometimes play big, important things in interpreting what, what novelists are trying to convey. And they're the unsung hero of these really important books that we know the authors of, but have no idea who edited it. Do you think this is maybe like her way of kind of calling out the editor's role perhaps in the process? 100%. I feel like she is the semi like homeless lady and that she would not have F anything without the editor. And this is a tribute to her maybe own mm -hmm. personal editor, a little shout out. Yeah. Yeah. 100% agree with that. Cause all along the way, the, the, the editor, like the main character in the story is following behind this author. The author is writing down her hopes and dreams. I hope my book is read. I hope people like it and, and throws these pieces of paper on the ground and they'd be lost forever unless an editor picks it up, right? It's yeah. the editor's job to select them. And if you remember when she was sick and she's mumbling her story and there's parts that the editor couldn't understand, she had to work or he, ah, oh, there, I did it. <laughs> he had to work. <laughs> he had to work with the writer to kind of correct it, to say, hey, this didn't make sense. Maybe if we do this, or can we elaborate or change this part? Literally, that's the editor's role is to make sure that the story is clear, that it's understood, or that, or, or when it needs to be, and that it's in a way that perhaps could be more consumable for people to be able to pick up and read. And that's what this editor does is, the mumbles, you know, he works through them and then creates the manuscript and then gives the novel back to her. And it's like, it's your story now. It's now your opportunity to publish this and make other people hear it. Because that's also one of the things at the end of the story is nobody remembers the writer, right? And isn't that so sad? Because that's kind of true about a lot of writers in life. Their legacy are these books. Unless these books make it out into the world, they're forgotten in the same way that the woman is in this story. So this love letter to the, the role of the editor and this man crafting and guiding an author, maybe as like the psychologist, like the hairdresser, <laughs> giving advice to people. <laughs> the, the editor is the therapist for the writer to help them get their story across. And it's the unsung hero. Mm, good story. I, I really like that concept. I did have one little twist that I kind of thought about with this is what if the lady isn't understood by anybody but the editor and that's kind of another interpretation too is sometimes mm. when authors try to get their point across nobody gets it and mm. they don't get it because they need an editor to be that that bridge between mm. what's in their mind to get out to the public because there are a few times that the editor says about his mother saying oh nobody understands that crazy old lady but he and his friends did and in the story, the editor is the only one that talks to the, the semi-homeless lady. And I think that is kind of significant and important is that these editors, the only ones that can interpret greatness. That's actually a really good point. Because if we recall too, the writers felt so vulnerable, right? When they would drop these manuscripts off that perhaps they can't open up to society the same way that they can to an editor. Like, like, how could you open up to an editor unless you make yourself vulnerable? And that's how these writers feel when they're dropping off their written word for them to rip apart, to edit, to put, to put together, or possibly make their dreams come true, and hopefully make some people happy with their story. 
And I think one of the goals of an editor, right, is to minimize criticism and maximize enjoyment. And I think that this editor here knew his own personal limitations and said, I can do X, Y, and Z, and I can help these people, but I'm not going to try to reach beyond my own limitations, except for her. He was the only, it's the only time that he went above and beyond. And I thought that was kind of that magical relationship between these two. And that sometimes not all editors and writers will work together in succinct like these two in his very first novel that he edited. Yeah, that's a great point. Let me hit you with another idea. Okay. okay. Let, let me hit you with a curveball here. <laughs> so many curveballs. Do you think we look down upon this woman because she hasn't written a book? Like she claims she's a writer. Well, show us your, your books. She's like, well, they were destroyed in the war. And, and to me, that was that hit me because we've read a lot of authors that have written in wartime, right? Kurt Vonnegut, who couldn't find the words for Slaughterhouse-Five for decades after the war. Like, war takes something from us. And here's this writer talking about how the war destroyed all of her stories, in a sense. But point being, did we look down upon her, this homeless woman, this woman that just walks around mumbling, like, ugh, whatever. And then do we potentially look at her in a different light once she does have the novel published, once she is an established writer, this external way of validating her claims? Do we then look upon her differently, potentially? Oh, I'm going to hit you with here. Basically, it comes down to don't judge a book by its cover. Oh! <laughs> <laughs> but think about so that. Good. Like if you've, if you've yeah. been at a party and you talk to, oh, I'm an aspiring writer, it's like, oh. How many Are books you, you published? That's the yeah. first question, right? Yeah, right. Well, right. none yet. Well, then are you right. really a writer? Right. Yeah. Hi, my name's James Patterson. It's like, oh, um, you've got like a million books. <laughs> <laughs> like we're going to look differently upon him once he has that artifact that proves he's a writer. And I just think that's so sad to think about how sometimes the way we judge someone can be based upon their output or what they've created. And uh, I think that adds to that concept of why writers might feel so vulnerable when they're turning in their work. And there's a perfect quote from this story that encapsulates kind of everything we've been talking about Quote, it's not that great people become writers, it's that writing important books makes us great. Oh, mm. that just, mm. that hits at home right there for me. That was yeah. my favorite quote from the story. Yeah, I feel like I'm getting more excited now talking about this than I was when I was actually reading it. That's not to say it was bad <laughs> or anything, but this is actually really cool. The way that she pulled this off, this love letter, and this these are very real things about how we do judge people by output and by these results and maybe that's why we feel so vulnerable because the difference between this book getting published or not is the difference between being forgotten or being remembered as great we've discussed this before of does an author have to have multiple published books to be a great author or do they just have to have the one masterpiece and that defines everything about them and i think for this editor you only need one one hit wonder and that's okay and you can accept that and move on and i think that's what the editor does when he's reflecting back on his own personal uh, involvement in writing books great story yoko ogawa another good one i i like this probably more than i liked her memory police is what i would say so if you're interested in hearing us talk about her and other Japanese authors, we'll leave some links down below for you to check out some more of our talks on her works. Let's move into our subjective wrap-up and ratings. Crypto, what are you going to give this one? I'm going to give this one a 9. I absolutely loved it. I, I love the characters. I love the setting. I love how it went back and forth, reminiscing. And I love that uh, it, it shows that all people are important, no matter maybe how insignificant we feel their jobs are, that without them, it wouldn't be possible in many avenues of life, not just maybe, you know, writing and publishing and editing, but you don't think about all the other people that make schools work or a business work or a restaurant work. It takes everybody for this to encapsulate greatness. Yeah. And I think this is one of those stories where I'd love to hear the feedback from writers and editors go read the story. If you know someone who's a writer or editor, make sure they read this story and, and tell them to come here and give us their thoughts because I'd love to know how did this story land upon them because to me, this was just such a cool exploration. Nine out of 10, highly recommended. 
We post videos every Monday and Wednesday. Wednesday? We post them on Thursdays. End of the night, people. <laughs> we need to cut this off. Thank you for joining and checking it out. If you want to support and, and aren't sure what to write down below, just leave us a little book emoji or something like that. We appreciate you guys hanging out with us for the night. My name is Una. Peace out. Peace.